Okay, so today we're going to be talking about using uh, Vue and ASP Core Web API together, which um, this presentation is going to be kind of, whoops, a little bit heavier on the Vue side. I said I put it together in a hurry. Um, but Vue is a kind of a, a, not newer, it's been around about four or five years now, but it's really starting to gain some traction in JavaScript single page application frameworks. So, oh, let me see, about me, here's the I love me slide. Um, I've been writing applications since the mid-80s. I know I look much younger than that, but it's true. I've been around a while. Um, first started off on a TRS-80, had an Apple IIc. Um, then we got the 2E. The 2E was awesome. It came with a hard drive. So that was pretty cool. Um, I've worked in government, worked for the House of Representatives. I've worked for, I was in the Army, um, paratrooper, ranger. Uh, been doing web applications for a while. I'm currently the director of IT and development at Blue Star Retirement Services. We're a 401k uh, record keeper here in town. We're actually in Ponte Vedra Beach, which is a few miles that way, probably about six, seven miles that way as a crow flies. We are looking for um, development staff always, so come see me if you'd like to talk about maybe possibly um, hear more about what we have to offer as a company. We are looking for mid to senior level developers. Um, our tech, we use Vue.js at work, we use ASP Core at work, we also have a bunch of web forms garbage we're still maintaining and trying to get rid of. The Vue and web forms is garbage. I absolutely hate web forms to the core of my soul. I think they're a, I cannot express to you how badly I hate web forms. Instead of Microsoft forcing developers to learn how the web works, they hid the way the web works and allowed WinForm developers to develop web applications without the faintest idea of how HTTP works. So we have a whole generation of web developers that don't know how the web works. I was one of them. I started uh, developing probably in VB6 uh, for the web and FoxPro. FoxPro had a, a bolt-on web. Yeah, you're making that face. You remember FoxPro. Um, FoxPro had that bolt-on web module. Um, it, was, it was awful VB6 web was ASP, classic ASP was awful. Web forms, I thought, oh, this is great, but it was really awful, made me a worse developer using web forms. So that's my little two cents on web forms. Um, I'm a college dropout, gonna finish one day, gonna need to be a good example to my son. Uh, member of American Mensa, which is, uh, most of you probably know what that is, and I catch a lot of crap for being in Mensa. So I need to explain something. You guys need to level set your expectations. Just because being really, really smart and being an idiot are not two extremes on the same spectrum. They exist independently. <laughs> They're not mutually exclusive. You can ask my wife. You can be a really, really smart person and a complete and total dummy about things, and she'll testify to that. Um, I am a brutal pragmatist. Um, I get hurt quite often because my hobbies are racing off-road motorcycles. Um, I got a seven-year-old who is just the most awesome little person in the world. I uh, got a 100-pound Doberman that has to sleep in between me and my wife every night. Uh, love beer and I love Nerf gun wars, so that's about it about me. Uh, if you want to hit me up, uh, woodywestbrook at gmail.com, or you can hit me up on LinkedIn. Um, Nerd Rage on Twitter, although I don't tweet that often. I just kind of follow people on it. Um, not much on Facebook. I, I like Facebook even less than I like web forms. <laughs> so um, I think, I think uh, Facebook is probably one of the worst things ever to happen to society. So, and that also influences my opinion on React, and we'll get into that in a second. <laughs> so um, we're going to talk about Vue, and we're also going to talk about um, spinning up an ASP Core uh, API project in here. Um, we're going to talk about why Vue, getting started with Vue. Um, just kind of give you a high level of view for those of you that haven't used it and how it relates to kind of other frameworks. We'll kick off a new project with the CLI and we'll spin up a, a web um, core API project. This is really easy stuff. Um, it's, it's shocking how easy it is. I mean, I'm a little bit belligerent how easy it is because when Vue came out and Angular came out, I had this beautiful GitHub repo where I just went and just killed all the Webpack config and just got all the loaders right and just had it immaculate. Then CLIs came out and rendered all of it worthless. I mean, and I was, I had a tough time letting go. I'm, on my team, I'm always, yeah, CLI's fine, but you guys really need to know how it works inside the box. You need to, in case it goes off the rails, you guys need to know Webpack, you need to know this. And I was so full of shit. 
I was wrong, wrong, wrong. It's good to know that stuff, but the CLIs, the command line interfaces for everyone, they've gotten so good now that you can just trust them. They just spin up a zero config project, especially in Vue. It's really, really good. <sighs> if I start talking too fast, let me know. Um, also, too, I kind of want, wanted this to be interactive as much as we can, so if you have questions, just pop your hand up. If I don't see you, just say, hey, and we'll get to you. So kind of want to just, like I said, be as interactive as we can and just answer questions as we go, if that's cool with everybody. So why choose Vue? So why Vue.js? So I'm going to say it twice. <sighs> so this is at one time, this is how I felt. It was just like I thought the world was going to collapse under the weight of JavaScript frameworks being introduced every day. And just the names, just if I or L-Y or whatever, it was awful. But I, get, I was an Angular guy through and through. I, even, I went through AngularJS and pretended to like it. I may force fed myself Angular. Um, Angular JS, and when Angular came out, I was like, "Oh, this is awesome!" Then Vue, I just then when Vue came out, I started getting into it, and I really liked it. All the things I couldn't stand with Angular were, just weren't there in Vue. So, so that's the Vue logo. So, for those of you that don't know, Vue is a progressive framework for building user interfaces. Much like React, it is just an interface library. It can be your entire front end with plugins like React. But at its core, it's a simple old JavaScript library. You can use it simply on a view engine and other projects. I've seen people use it just to render components in like MVC pages. You don't have to use it as your complete front end, but you get a lot of cool stuff if you do. Um, like, like say here, view was designed from the ground up to be incrementally adoptable, kind of like what I just said. You can just put in, it's really modular, and you can put in bits and pieces. Uh, uh, views, uh, we covered everything there. So um, while we're talking about view, we'll talk about ASP Core also. I don't have any slides on it. Sorry I didn't prepare those, but we can run through the high points on it. Is anybody using Core? Anybody adopted Core yet at work? It's pretty awesome, isn't it? It's, uh, those of you that use Core, um, are you coming from like a, do you have any Node or Express background? I, it feels like ASP Core was really informed by how Node works and Express works. Um, when you get into an ASP Core application, now you really have this wonderful service pipeline um, that you can start plugging middleware into. Middleware is now kind of a full-fledged citizen in ASP Core, and it doesn't have to be um, <clears throat> doesn't have to be kind of shimmed in like we did in the past. Um, ASP Core now comes with native dependency injection, which just works and it's awesome. Um, it's faster. It's portable. It will run on pretty much anywhere, depending on which version of the library you use. If you, if you use the portable libraries, you can run it on Linux. Um, you can build ASP Core apps on your MacBook. There's uh, several IDE options. You can use Visual Studio, which is my preferred IDE for working in C Sharp. It's, I still think it's the best one out there. Code is pretty good also. Um, it's a good experience. And also JetBrains has a new IDE um, for working in Visual Studio. And I cannot remember what it's called now. Anybody remember what the JetBrains ID for Visual Studio is called? Writer. Writer, there you go. So I haven't checked out Writer yet, but I'm a huge fan of WebStorm and DataGrip. So, um, so yeah, so like I'm saying, um, ASP Core is just, it's a lot better than classic, than our older ASP.NET words. It's smaller, it's more nimble, and the whole entire framework for the most part is better. Um, for data access, you have um, Entity Framework Core, which is an improvement over Entity Framework, but I still don't think it's good enough, to be honest with you. Um, we don't use it at our office. We use a um, combination of Dapper and AutoMapper and good old ADO.net um, to do most things. Um, reason being, Entity Framework is still just not fast enough for some things. We're, we deal with record sets sometimes of in the tens of millions. And um, even with change tracking disabled, we found the any framework just is not as fast as going down to the metal with ADO.net. So unfortunately, your mileage may vary, though. Um, not everybody's problems are the same. My problems aren't your problems, so you may not have to deal with record sets that big all the time. And if you don't, it may be com uh, completely acceptable for you. So anybody, anybody have any questions? I know we don't have any slides up to you, peruse, but anybody have any questions or experiences with um, ASP Core? So if you haven't used it yet, go ahead and check it out. It's really cool. We're going to be looking at it in a second. It is a big improvement over um, the classic ASP, over the former ASP.NET model. So 
Getting back to Vue, why Vue.js? Well, Vue.js is easy to learn. It is just, it's a fun framework. You guys ever got a hold of a tool that is just fun to use and you just look forward to working in it, it's just a pleasure? That's what Vue.js is to me. It's just a pleasure to work with and the modern JavaScript tools are just so mind-blowingly good to me. The linters, um, uh, Prettify, the IDEs, they, like, those of us have been developing a while, we remember when you were not supposed to put JavaScript in a web page. The worst thing you could do for a website was to add JavaScript to it. And then we started getting back, JavaScript's okay, jQuery kind of changed all that. Um, the reason being um, that jQuery changed is it was compatible across my in, IE Internet Explorer 5, Netscape Navigator, it worked. It worked in AOL's browser. It fixed all the problems we were having back in the day because we could write um, JavaScript one time and it would work relatively the same across all the browsers, which that was revolutionary back in the day. So, jo so jQuery just kind of dominated and it's still really awesome. I, people always bag on jQuery now because it's fashionable to say, oh, jQuery's garbage, don't use it. jQuery's awesome. It's still awesome to this day and it still solves a lot of your problems. Um, I've seen a lot of people come in with these spa frameworks doing things that could probably be better done in jQuery. If you don't need a spa front end framework, might not be the best choice for you. Uh, the issues with jQuery and where I'm going with this is, it just, it's really easy to end up with a big pile of spaghetti. There's no structure, no form in jQuery. Whereas with the, frame, with the spa frameworks, the tooling's gotten so good, if you put a bracket in the wrong place, it screams at you. I mean, the linters are really, really awesome in the tool that we have now. And you can set all that stuff up to run um, with your jQuery projects too, but it's just such a colossal pain. It's gnarly, so. <sighs> Vue is fast. It's uh, like React. It's got a virtual DOM. It's fast. It's getting faster every day. Um, Vue.js is not opinionated. Angular is very opinionated. When you're writing Angular, you're not really doing JavaScript anymore, or TypeScript per se. You're writing Angular code. You're doing everything the Angular way, which is kind of one of the things that always bothered me about Angular. You couldn't really get outside the box with Angular, and you're just using the whole package. Um, so Vue is more in the React school. It's like, take it or leave it. You can use this component or not. It doesn't care how you do things. And Vue is pretty dead simple. It's a really easy, simple framework to learn. So getting started. So we're going to talk about, uh, whoa, my slide's out of order. So uh, tooling, set up your environment, Vue CLI. So we'll talk about tooling real quick. We kind of already talked about it. Um, the Let me get on my notebook here. So the first thing in view, and let me see if you guys can see this. Okay, cool. So the first thing you need in view is the um, view CLI. That is the starting point. It's a command line interface. You can set up view manually, but the CLI makes it so much easier. So let's see what we have here. So you just, you can download CLI from node. What have I got running? Okay. So, if you've got, um, uh, no, I can never type when somebody's watching me. I, not dash I, I, I dash G. And it's just, I think it's at view, view CLI. Um, just install that, and that's going to wire in your view CLI for you. I'm not going to do it here because it's going to kill my bandwidth on, their neck, on my internet connection. But that will run through installing the view CLI. And then once you, get, once you get the CLI installed, you can do some pretty neat stuff with it. So, so here we have the options. And if you're going to start a new view project, just use the CLI. Just point blank use it. Don't wire the stuff up manually. Don't do Webpack yourself. Um, use the view CLI. It's on 3.0 and it's pretty robust now. So you can, the commands from the CLI are create, which is us getting started, creating a new application, and we'll do that in a second. It gives you a bunch of configuration options. Um, add, which it allows you to add plugins, um, like Beautify, which is a uh, pretty, pretty good uh, interface library um, of controls for Vue. Um, invoke, I haven't used that one before. Inspect, um, serve, build, UI, init. So, uh, documentation, you can go to the, the, just Google View CLI and you can get to their GitHub repo. It's, they got really good documentation. Um, and there are a couple of other competing pro uh, products now, but I think the View CLI is just kind of the easiest way to get going in a project. And I mean, it's dead simple. So we'll go to, uh, uh, 
Let me see here. So. Come on, view. There we go. So, can everybody see that? Is it, that's probably really hard to see, huh? So, I don't have the magnifier on this computer, so I'm sorry. Um, so, the, so, the default, um, when you, it comes with a bunch of presets. So, right out of the box, the default is Babel and ESLint. So, but you can come down here and we can uh, manually select our features. So, and it will, it's going to wire all these up for you out of the box when you create a new view application. Babel, you have the option to use TypeScript also. Um, word about TypeScript, I love to TypeScript in Angular. It works in Vue, but I just don't think the tooling is all the way there yet. I think it's a little bit more of a hassle and there are more hoops to jump through to use it and get it running than I care to, than I care to endure. Um, if you use TypeScript, you still need to use Babel for the shims. Um, You've got to set up TSLint and ESLint. Um, Prettier, which uh, gets installed by, CL, by the CLI, doesn't always work like you want it to with TypeScript, so there's got to do some manual configuration there. So the, the entire reason I want to use the CLI so I don't have to get in the plumbing and do the manual configuration stuff anymore. So for me, like I said, you may, your mileage may vary with TypeScript. You may absolutely have to have TypeScript, and it'll work, and you'll be happy with it. It's just we decided not to because there are just too many hoops setting it up. And if I'm struggling with it on the team and know the most about Vue, I didn't want the other guys to be banging their heads against the wall. And when I say guys, that is non-gender specific, sorry. There's people. I didn't want the other people, personages, mammals, to get <laughs> to have issues. So having said that, you can pick um, TypeScript. You can set it up as a PWA right off the bat um, here if you select that. You can include Vue Router which you obviously are gonna need routes. It wouldn't be a very interesting application if it didn't do anything or just displayed one page all the time. Um, Vuex, uh, who here is using Vuex in your view applications? Ooh, boo. So why, why are you guys not using Vuex? Just out of curiosity. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, you got, are you guys using? The table back there, I'm going to pick on you guys because you said you're using Vue. Are you uh, writing production apps in Vue? Uh, does you, okay, so you are using state management. Okay, so for those of you that don't know, I mean, pretty sure, probably everybody's worked in React or Angular. Vuex is the flux implementation in Vue. It's basically Redux for Vue, um, state management. It's got the really, really cool tools in the browser. That, Re that React does, um, the Vue um, dev tools, which are awesome. You can go in there, look at your state, you can roll back in time on your state, and we'll look at that in a second. So, probably want to include Vuex, and if you, if you spin up a project and you don't include any of these, you can go back and add them. I mean, it's just npm, dash s, save, uh, whatever you want to, then you just have to do a little bit of wiring up manually. It just gives you the option right now to do it. So, CSS preprocessors, so, um, yeah, you can choose like SAS or SCSS, um, whichever ones you want to include. Um, view support small. Um, linter formatter, so you can go with ESLint, TSLint. So, um, unit testing. So let's look here. Let's we'll pick a couple of options. Let's go with View Router. We'll put Vuex in here. Yeah, you gotta have CSS preprocessors. So. Use history mode for the router, so it gives you some options so it can further configure each of the settings we just chose. So we definitely want HTML, HTML5 history mode because nobody likes hashtags in their um, routes anymore. So we'll go yes on there. Um, so we've got to pick a, our um, CSS preprocessor. So I'm old school, I just like Node, SAS, but you can have the options here. And if you're not constrained by what's in here, these are just the options it's going to wire up for you. If you have something else you like to use, I mean, it's, it's a JavaScript library. You just plug it in at runtime, um, and design time, rather. Um, we can use less. I like SCSS, so we'll go with there. Um, Linter. So you get to, if we had picked TypeScript, um, setting up the project, it'd have TSLint being an option here. Uh, ESLint, Airbnb config. I typically go with Airbnb config. I have to make a few changes to it. Um, that's a, I mean, a decent kind of catch-all option. It's already got a bunch of rules in there for you. Uh, 
Well, the, what's the one thing that kills me on Airbnb? Yeah, I think they use spaces instead of tabs. I just, I like tabs. Don't mean to start a holy war. Anybody use spaces? Yeah, let me tell you why you're wrong. No. <laughs> no. I'm just, I'm lazy. Everything comes down to me being lazy. So the least amount of keystrokes I can make to do something, I'm, I'm going to take the path of least resistance on pretty much everything. I just, that's how I am. So we'll go with Airbnb config. Um, lint on save, or you can lint and fix on commit. I always choose lint on save because I just like to know right there if I'm having issues. You can, all, you can also run the linter with a dash dash fix, and it'll generally try to clean up most of the issues that you're having with the application. So we're going to hit that. Uh, where do you prefer placing config for everything that's wiring up here? Um, it can either do it in your um, package.json file, which I don't like, um, but you can choose that, or you can get a dedicated config file for each one. You can get like a, uh, well, you see them there, your ES link config, your, you'd have your Babel config, you'd have a TS link config had we chosen that. So I like having all the different files, so we're just going to go with that option. And you can save this as a preset for future projects, but I don't tend to do that because I kind of change my mind. <laughs> every, I want to play with different stuff every time I come through here. So we'll click no. And now it's going to go crazy installing all this stuff. So as fascinating as it is watching, and I'm going to actually, because I've already got a project spun up, we're going to kill that and save my data cap on my, I'm using my little wireless dongle. So. All right, so that's basically how easy it is to set up a view application. We're going to look at what it's set up there in a second. Um, for other tooling, uh, IDE of choice, I mean, anybody remember one called Atom? Yeah. <laughs> anybody still using Atom? I mean, code ate its lunch, didn't it? I mean, I, 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 couldn't, I just couldn't use code because they didn't have folding in the code on. I was waiting for it. That was the feature I needed, and it's, there's no looking back after that. Uh, but Atom works great. Uh, code works great. They all have some wonderful plugins for Vue. There's Vtor, uh, V-E-T-U-R. is a plugin for Vue that gives you all the syntax highlighting um, and everything you need in code. It's pretty good. Uh, my personal preference is WebStorm. Um, I know it's a paid product, but it's awesome. It's a really, really good IDE, and we're, everybody kind of gives paid products a uh, hard time, but if people didn't pay for software, none of us would be in here. So. <laughs> So it's, the JetBrains guys make really good tools. I, I don't mind plugging them a bit. Um, ReSharper is awesome in your uh, Visual Studio IDE. It's, once you've used it, you can't go back to not using it. Um, for those of you that worked in mixed data environments, like we have Oracle, SQL, and Mongo at my office, um, uh, what's called a data grip is one IDE that lets you connect to everything. And that's pretty, pretty cool. And it's, it's about as easy to use as um, SQL Server Management Studio for me. And, um, I, I hate Oracle. Oracle's right up there with Facebook <laughs> and web forms. So anybody using Oracle? I'm sorry. I am so, so sorry. The, we're on standard edition Oracle, which basically costs a Honda Accord a year to use. Um, yeah, it's, it's outrageously expensive. And to go up to version 18, it's going up in price 400% for standard edition. They're charging four times as much per core for version 18 to upgrade to. Okay, they're catching me on camera, so I'm not going to say what I want to say about Oracle, but it rhymes with truck, and I <laughs> do not like Oracle. So, and all the performance tooling that comes with SQL Server and uh, free with Mongo, you got to pay extra for in Oracle. So to get basically the equivalent of what we have with SQL Server, we have to pay $100,000 to get all the tooling in Oracle that we need annually. So, yay! So, okay, we saw the view CLI. We talked about setting up your environment. Um, anybody have any questions on IDEs or running through the view CLI? Cool. So, view is component based, much like React. Um, and React's awesome. I just don't like Facebook. I mean, that's the whole entire punchline of that joke. And I just I can't bring myself to use Facebook tools like Yarn or React just because I have a tremendous philosophical issue with Facebook. Um, Google too. I just, I mean, you saw my Gmail, you, I can't get away from it, but the older I get, the, the more I just resent people selling my data and also the inf influencing others with incorrect data. So it's, it bothers me the amount of power that some of these companies wield without any responsibility or oversight. So that's, your mileage may vary. Those are my own personal opinions. You don't have to share them. You don't have to like them, but I'm up here talking, so I get to say it. So. 
Um, view components are at the heart of view. Like I said, much like React, a view component is basically an atomic unit of functionality in view. View components um, allow you to break your application down into discrete and modular units. Uh, components contain their own templates, their own styles, and their own logic. So a view component is typically made up of, um, let me see. Okay, so we'll go back and get to that in a sec. So view components are typically single file. The paradigm in view is you have your template, your code, your JavaScript code, and your CSS all in the single file. You can break that out into, mul into multiple files. Uh, multiple files if you want to, but it kind of, it starts getting messy if you do that. I know in Angular you get like the, we, um, I haven't used Angular since like four or five, so if it's changed, pardon me, but you got like your Angular, your component file, then you'll have your CSS and your template. It just throws down the pattern in Angular as a separate file for everything. In Vue, we like to keep it all in one file, and to me it's a lot cleaner. It kind of forces you to kind of keep your files compact. You don't want big components. Big components are pretty much the enemy in any JavaScript application. Um, there's a quote, I can't remember who said it, but you ha the quote's along the lines of you, act you have to actively fight complexity every day because if you don't, it will win and it will suck. So keep things as simple as you can. And it's, I mean, we've all gone back to code we wrote like a year or two ago <laughs> and just like, oh my God, what, what is this? I don't know what I'm doing, having to fix an old bug. So um, keep your components simple and we'll look at the syntax in a bit. Um, there's a bunch of different um, string type templates you can use with Vue, and your template's basically just how you render in the HTML to the browser. Um, string, inline, render functions, template literals, um, X templates, and JSX, you can use all those, uh, boo, JSX. Um, but single file components are the way to go, and that's what we're gonna look at here. It's what I recommend, it's what all the documentation in Vue um, is built around. So, and we'll look at how they kind of keep things organized and clean here in a bit. So this is a view component. Let me see if my laser, po oh, we got lasers. Awesome, too bad my cat's not here. <laughs> well, last year somebody brought a green one, so we were like battling on the whole time. So, uh, so this is a, a very simplistic component, but it's a component. So up here we have the template, and template is just basically, like I said, the, output, the browser output, what we're gonna output to the browser, rather. This right here is our script. This is the heart of view. This is our view component right here where we have all our logic. Um, you can put regular JavaScript functions in there. Um, they will be scoped to this particular component. And we have the um, style down here. And like I said, we got to kind of rush through this stuff, but there's a lot of nuance in this stuff, especially with styles and how styles will cascade down from parent component to child components and a lot of things that aren't necessarily um, intuitive with view. Um, so you need to hit the documentation. One thing you'll notice like right here, you'll see that scoped and that just means that all the CSS there is locked into that component. When it goes through the build process, um, the view transpiler will basically just append random, uh, a random identifier onto these styles and it'll be scoped in the HTML to this component. We'll look at that in a second. And, oh, and the last thing we see here is like SCSS, um, you can pick, you can use SAS or just nothing there. So SCSS is valid right there. Um, so you can just pick what kind of language you want your style to be. And this is a class of view component. Now the TypeScript components, one big th plus for using TypeScripts is you get to have class-based components. So look those up, those are pretty cool. Um, it's basically works just like a TypeScript class or and you guys are familiar with the .NET side of things, I mean a class is a class. And it's pretty neat how it works because then you just have methods and properties uh, versus the um, specific view syntax for like um, computed properties and the methods and the data object and everything else. So, uh, view components are typically straightforward, <laughs> strive to be, and they need to be highly re and keep them highly readable. So this. Again, just another example of a um, view component, and you can pretty much look at that component and tell what's happening here. We see we have a, the name of the component. We can see that this component's importing other components. Um, we have a data function, which data, the data function in view just returns data um, to the component for use elsewhere. Um, we have a methods, which those are your JavaScript functions are scoped to this component. Um, we have computed. Um, computeds are kind of, they're parameterless methods in Vue. They're kind of, they give you properties. It's where you kind of 
some of your more complex um, properties and everything, you'll put in your computed section. And then we have mix-ins. Mix-ins are pretty awesome. They kind of fake an inheritance for Vue. So if you have like a lot of functions or a lot of common functionality that you're doing over and over and over again, you can put that in a mix-in and share that mix-in across several components. And we'll look at that in a sec. So, so um, binding in Vue is pretty cool. So this is um, property binding. It's just a colon, um, clicking, attribute binding rather. Um, just use a shorthand of a colon and uh, event binding is just shorthand of a, the, what you call it, the at symbol. So you can write it out longhand like V on click, but just at and click and you're good to go. So, and these obviously bindings up in our template. So, uh, well, it can bind to pretty much any data object you have in your component or data that's being packed, coming from your uh, state, or any data you expose through your component it can bind to. So, I mean, is that kind of a vague, quite vague answer, but does that? Just keep it, I, I got the uh, bind like previous object, what, what you're saying. So, I, I, just, I just moved it in the React, you, you bind like this, and you use it like, uh, or you use ES6 syntax, like, if it's gonna bind to this. So, well, we have to stick with the view syntax because the, the transpiler for view has to go through and make sense of it when it, do when it does its thing. So, but this is, um, I said the click event, we're binding to, uh, binding to the method on the view and the methods in the view component right here. Um, this right here, we're bi um, binding to selected item, which is a property in our data object on the component. So selected item dot source, which is a image, it's a URL, it's a property there. So. And of course, a good old fashioned string interpolation. So everybody's got that in the hand of bars. V also has some conditional operators that you can use. Um, v template if. So it basically the V ifs evaluate truthiness. So if um, login type is username is truthy, then it will show this. Um, it will render this component. If it's not, it'll um, append a hidden onto it in CSS so it won't see it. Um, there's also a v.show, which um, v.show on the surface works kind of like v.if, but except v.if will still render something to the DOM. It just won't show it. v.show, it won't go in the DOM, won't go to the virtual DOM. So if you've got a real, it's, I got it backwards. Oh. I may have my slide, my slide wrong. I'm pretty sure, pretty sure v.show does not render it to the DOM. If you, if you v.show equals false, okay, I might be wrong. Somebody pull out the Google. Somebody, we're going we're gonna to come back to this. Somebody Google me. So we're going to get back to that. So, and we have our four iterators. Um, v, Vue has a pretty neat um, iterator syntax. So um, just for each object, one thing you will notice is you can put a index object in your view or your key, and that is accessible. So index key and view, so that's a um, integer property that goes on that gets created when you iterate your for loop, so it just helps keep track of things in the DOM for you. Did you? Oh, okay, so I had it backwards. Sorry. I was stretched how much I use V show. So I gotta correct that. The slide was right, I was wrong. So and um, you can also bind your style components. Um, there's a lot of great information on here. Oh crap. Time gets away from you. So let's look at um, styling components, lifecycle hooks. We also have um, View has the standard lifecycle hooks. Um, I can't remember all of them off the top of my head, but it's mounted, created, um, destroyed, unmounted. Um, before um, before load. So if you go to the Vue's website, you can get the list of all the different um, lifecycle hooks, and they just go in there in your Vue application and in your Vue component, and you can just uh, tap into them. You can put them in your mix-ins, and it's a lot of them are good spots to kind of where you start pulling data into Vue. Like on created, you may want to query your store to render data to the page, or you may want to do some cleanup on destroy. So. 
Um, we talked about mix ends. So mix ends are just a flexible way to share um, common functionality across view components. So if you like got some cleanup code that goes in like a created um, lifecycle hook every time you're doing something, then you can create a mix in and just add that mix into the component. <sighs> so um, view can have child components. You can pass data into its child components um, through, a ver through um, properties. That's not the best way to do it. We're going to talk about state here in a minute. Pretty much the best way to pass data in view is with state management. But you can go old school like we do in um, our .NET applications and other applications where we're just using properties and cascading data up and down. Um, I don't recommend doing that. There's so such great tooling and view based around um, state management that it's, it's just silly not to use it. The tooling's so good. And we'll look at state management here in a sec. Sharing data with Pro, and that's my slides broke. So there's going to be some interesting content here, but there's not. So let's look at the application. Let's look at an application real quick. So whew. So this is WebStorm. Like I said, I'm a fan of WebStorm. So this is what the application looks like. Can we see that? That's good. Come on. Oh, let me see here. Let me. Settings. So, get my font bigger on here. Bear with me one second. Uh, I'm going for the editor one, the IDE. Give me one second, we'll get to the IDE font, font real quick. And try one six here. Okay, there we go. A little bit is that a little bit better? Okay. So we'll get our toggle down here. So this is what it looks like in WebStorm. Um, looks real I mean the folder layout and the files are gonna be the same um, regardless of what IDE you're using. So when we create a application with the CLI, this is what we get. So you can see these are all the individual files when we said we want our config to be and configuration files is what they look like. Um, I added a prettier RC to make sure prettier um, it, it, this comes it, prettier is a formatter excuse me so if you do control alt shift P format your code uh, makes it can fix all the linting errors on it. Um, prettier in ESLint doesn't read ESLint it just uses general guidelines so sometimes you have to tell it specifically line up the rules with ESLint and that's basically what this is doing here. Um, not using the editor config on this one. Um, Babel config, pretty clean. And all this goes into your app data folder. If you're on Windows, it goes in your app data folder. Um, you'll have the big config files are hidden away, abstracted in there from you. So if you want to go take a look at them, they, are in, they do get laid down in your app data folder, um, but you don't need them for the project. The CLI does all the magic for you. Um, package.json, package lock, um, CSS config, I mean, real minimal configuration on all this. Uh, for this we're using a little proxy item. Uh, web, it's called view.config.js but basically this is those of you that have messed with um, excuse me with Webpack will recognize this as Webpack config. So we're basically setting up a reverse proxy on the Webpack dev server so get away the cores, um, get rid of the cores issues for the point purpose of the demo. So where the magic starts happening in here is we get a sort we get the public and the source folders laid down. Public is where we're going to lay down our index.html. This is just the placeholder file that everything's going to going to root to. And then we get the rest of these files laid down, assets, components. Um, I like everything in components to be in a subfolder because sometimes you can have multiple components in this folder. So kind of grouping um, things like functionality. So let's look at a kind of a, a robust build component, um, view component right here until we have. So, and this, let's see, this little application um, is a robot builder. So this is a, um, Jim Cooper did this app on Pluralsight and I came back and changed it um, to work with uh, ASP Core. So this just allows us to build a robot. Ooh, and we're not getting anything. So let's see what's happening here. So we should have the option to build a little robot. So let's open up our tools and see what's going on. 
So, up, uh, parsing error. Doesn't look like we're hitting request failed with status code 500. That's not good. Better our API is not running. So, we'll get in here. Um, this is the view dev tools I was telling you about. Um, those of you that have used ones in React, this is going to look really familiar to you. Um, this is really, really awesome. It allows you to go in here and um, inspect your view application as it's running, and you can see everything. It's, have, are you guys using this and then played with view? I mean, can, you can't live without it. It's absolutely required. And this is what's awesome about using state. There is a, if you see here, there's view X tab, and we'll look at that in a second. But this is what is so awesome about, you can see every bit of data in your application in one spot, and you can see how it's changed. It can give you snapshots in time. Every time that state changes, you can go back and look and see the mutations on that state. So that's pretty cool. So, but the issue right now is I don't think I've started my um, web server. So, so let's start our web server. So, and this is our IIS um, Express uh, website here. So, this is our core, ASP.NET Core. This is pretty simple, and we'll go back and look at this in a second. So, actually, let's make sure we're getting, oh, there he goes doing his thing. So, pretty simple um, web API application. We're talking about the request pipeline and middleware right here. This, I mean, this is it. This is a completely different scenario than your old day um, MVC. Here you get to plug in anywhere. Um, I did it. go ahead and add in a cores middleware here. If you're using any framework, you're, that's middleware here. You're going to plug in middleware. Um, dependency injection is going to get plugged in. So it's just they've really tried to make ASP core uh, really modular and componentized and lighter. So basically instead of just taking everything and all using part of it, you're just using what you need and taking that. So it's really, really cool. It's faster and easier to work with than classic, um, than the ASP.NET um, for um, two through four, whatever. So now I think we've got this built. Let me see here. Values, oh my goodness, what's going on here? The application, the filler. There we go. So we're getting some parts from our API. So that means view should be getting parts from our API. We'll go back over there in a sec. So again, this is a really, really um, simplistic application. Um, in a real world API, obviously you're going to want some kind of authentication and authorization scheme going. Um, probably the best best work with is going to be some kind of claims based auth using um, a identity server, identity provider. Um, at our office, we're using identity server four. Um, so and claims for this, so basically just you'll pass a JavaScript web token um, with your request and it'll get validated um, by your API. Uh, there's some, a, uh, Identity Server 4 is a great one. I think Okta uh, offers it as a service. Um, there's a bunch of offerings out there and that's kind of outside the scope of this. So we'll just, having said that, let's go look at our controller. We've got a couple of controller here. We have a parts controller. And like I said, it's, I mean, it's real simplistic. We're just um, have a, the route here and we're this parts object and we're just returning an in-memory list of parts that we're generating down here. In a real application, obviously, you're going to want to hit a database um, or some kind of data store to bring back data. So, but just to show how easy it is to get this thing working with ASP Core, um, we keep it in simple here. So we see that our API is returning data, so let's go look at our view app, see if we can refresh this and get some data out of it. So let's refresh this. And we're still not getting any data. So let's see here. I want to make sure my, my proxy is going to the right place. So we'll double check our proxy here and see what's happening. So viewconfig.js. So we'll make sure our target. Oh, that's where we go. So I'm going to a port that's not running. So. So there you go. One of the awesome things about, about the new job, if you haven't worked in some of the new, yep, look there, I'm getting proxy errors right there saying it couldn't hit that. So I'm going to terminate this job, yes, and we're going to start over. One of the neat things uh, what I was going to say about all the modern JavaScript tooling and frameworks is just the watchers in Webpack. I mean, as soon as you make a change to a file, the hot, the hot reloading on the website, um, in the modules, it's so, so stinking cool. Cause I mean, there are lots of us that, I mean, in ASP, you learn the trick where you basically 
can keep the website open instead of using it on IS Express, getting it to close every time. So, I mean, I know a bunch of us sitting there, we type in the file, save it, go hit refresh without having to fire the debugger back up. It's, you don't really have to do that anymore with the JavaScript web apps. It's just a much better experience. So let's come over here and see, let's refresh here and see if we get some data now. Oh, look at there. So we are getting data. We're getting a, getting a little robot. So like I say this is a pretty much a simplistic application, but it's pulling the data back from our API core um, service. And what we can look at here, one of the really cool things about Vue is everything in Vue can be exp exposed here through the Vue um, tools, um, dev tools. And this is really, really slick. And one of, the slick, one of the slicker options here is you can go and inspect your state. Now, state management, uh, any of you guys working with state management like Reactor? Anybody, is this a, anybody completely new to the concept? I don't wanna, okay. I don't want to glide. It took me forever to wrap my head around state management. I hated it at first because I didn't understand what they meant by unidirectional data flow and I just couldn't wrap my brain around it, which it's kind of, it doesn't unidirectional data flow. It still flows um, both directions. It's just all at once or you're pulling state back. And there's just the rules about you can't mutate state, direct, you can't change state. You have to go through mutators um, in order to set it. So the rules, but once I, it clicked for me, it's, there's no other way to do an application now. A website it's just it's awesome so the tooling on here we can come in here and we can look at our state so we can look at we can look at view x and see what our payload is so this particular payload is pretty simple it's just this javascript um, back from coming back from our api it's loading getting loaded in the state now your state um, in view x can also have custom properties you can set properties on your state and expose those so it doesn't necessarily all have to come through um, come through your API. So let's look at our we'll look at our state real quick. So state is is store and store can be if your store is going to get big because it's all data in your application is coming through your store and getting put in state. So um, what Vuex does and Rack does to um, Flux does to is allow you to break your state into modules. So your modules can line up and be pretty much uh, business domain specific or however you want to break them up. So the modules basically are kind of the children of your parent state, of your parent store. So we'll look at this. So we have a store here and view store, it's pretty simple. It's you're just in, um, exporting a new object um, this is our root state. Root state is accessible to all the um, modules up under it. So all the children, all the child models, our getter, when we want to access something in state, we have to access it through a getter. We pull something back. Um, and states can be namespaced or not namespaced. The distinction there is there are certain behavioral rules that state, state is always namespaced, excuse me. Your stores can be namespaced or not namespaced. Your state is always going to be namespaced. So if you have, um, say, this property foo on our root state, we can also have property foo on, let's go and look at our modules. We can also have property foo on our um, robot state. So because state is namespaced, we're not going to have a collision there. We're going to have um, .store.foo or .robots.foo. So, but um, the modules are not name are not default namespaced. So, so the state being exposed is, na is always namespaced. Modules aren't by default, which that gets becomes an issue when you start looking at mutations and actions. Um, they aren't namespaced by default, so I recommend just adding namespace equals true up here to avoid collision. So this way, if you have, like, say, an action that's going to be get parts on your root state, on your root module, and get parts on the child module, when you call that from your application, it's going to execute both of them if they're not namespaced. And that can have unintended consequences. Um, it doesn't namespace the modules by default. Namespace your modules. I can't. <laughs> I mean, I can't think of a, a use case personally, but I'm not very imaginative where we haven't um, namespaced our modules. It just makes more sense and keeps everything cleanly separated for us. And you just do that up here by um, hitting the namespace property to true. So, so this, like I said, this is our store um, mix-ins that we talked about. So we have a created hook here. So just a real simple created hook for view. Every time a component gets created that's using this mix-in, we're just logging it to the screen. Um, that mix-in is, let me see if we got it in Robot Builder here. So. 
So we'll look at let's look at this template in a little bit more detail. So mixins, yeah, there we hit. So mixins is a property on the object we're exporting here. So Looking at this, this is kind of a more robust example of a view component. So we have um, the created item here, which this is um, one of our lifecycle hooks. So we're telling this um, whenever this um, object is created to run this get parts uh, method, which is going to be down here in methods. And get parts is going to be hitting our store and bringing something back. So um, we you also in routing, we didn't discuss routing a lot, but routing. It works just like it does in Angular and um, React. It's, you, you set up a routes object here. Uh, let me go to my routes. Man, an hour flies by. <laughs> so, so your routes are set up, I mean, pretty similar paradigm. You import whatever components you're going to be exposing on the route. Um, then just define your routes. You can have child routes in view, parameterized routes, of course. This works almost identical to how it works in Angular. I haven't looked at uh, React in 100 years, but I'm assuming, I mean, it works pretty similar to React. Um, you just name the path to the route, and then um, whatever the component is getting routed to. You can have before, you can have route guards on here, which before enter, um, run some validation, like making sure your params are valid for your route. You can have um, before leave to make sure like you say you have stuff in your shopping cart or what have you before you um, route to another page you want to do some validation make sure it's safe to navigate um, routes can be called from the router they can also be called from the templates obviously you want to have like your menu items and you can also do it programmatically from the um, component itself so let's go back to a robot builder so so right here, um, before route leave, like I said, it's just a route guard. So to, from, next is default parameters for the route. So in this one, we're just saying, if this dot added to cart, if you have an item in your cart, make sure you click OK before it leaves. So um, just using a standard good old fashioned JavaScript response box here, which ESLint does not like, so I had to disable that for ESLint. So um, the components property on the view is just importing child components. So. We're telling this, hey, these are going to be my child components here. So, and those are other view components that get pulled into this. Data is a special property in view. It's just what it is it, it returns a JavaScript object of data that can be anything you want it to be. Um, once you, it's basically more used for me for testing to get my view components up and running and kind of play with and check out binding and everything. I use the data object. Once you're doing real stuff and pulling back from an API or an external store, um, I haven't seen that. It's you typically use it too much. Um, mix ends, we talked about that. Computed properties, they're just returning read-only properties on your object that you can bind to. Generally, if you have to do something pretty complex, um, some calculations get to a property, it will be in computed. Like, um, if we look at a good example of this would be how many items are in our shopping cart. So that's going to be a computed property because we're going to just basically take an array and, um, and populate it as we need to. So. And that is the wrong instance of WebStorm. That's my presentation. So methods, methods are just what they are everywhere else. These are methods. This dot, dot, dot syntax, sorry, I'm trying to hurry. Ooh, I'm out of time. The dot, dot, dot syntax are spread operators. Um, come to their part of Vuex. So basically, it's taking our Vuex actions and getters, and we can spread them to either be properties or methods here in our view component. Um, man. <laughs> I'm out of time. I saw so much more to talk about. So long story short, Vue is really, really awesome. This is supposed to be like kind of an introduction to using it with um, ASP Core. It's, there's, there's no drama. It just works. It's simple to use it. Um, so that's why we spent more time talking about Vue. If you have any questions, please hit me up. I'm going to be here all weekend. You guys are awesome. Any questions right now? Well, we have a couple minutes. Sorry I talked so much. Thank you all. Thank you for your patience.